Welcome to Talking in Stations, a podcast about EVE Online. I'm your host, Matt Earl. So we're going to go around the table today, talk about the news, the patch notes that are coming out for January, and uh, we'll catch up with a few things here and there, especially the monthly economic report. Uh, as we know, EVE Online has a massive economy, so we'll check that out. First, let's talk to uh, um, our panel. Uh, let's meet our panel. Uh, we'll start with Carneros. Good morning, everyone. If you can see me on the video part of our segment, I'm on a really nice lumberjack planet. It's great. <laughs> That's why you have flannel Sorry. on. <laughs> Sorry for the podcast, guys. Um, also returning is Elise Randolph. Hey, how's it going, everyone? We have Jurius Doctor with us. Hello, everybody. And our guest is Brisk Rubal. Morning, everyone. Thanks for having me on again. If it's Sunday, it's Talking in Stations. That's right. Uh, Brisk is also a CSM member, we should say. That's a player representative to the Council of Stellar Management. So we'll talk to him about some of the stuff that's going on uh, behind the scenes over there. Yay, Brisk. There we go. That's what I'm here for. All right. Well, let's uh, get into some news here. Uh, you may have noticed that last night, um, so that would be Saturday. Well, night is hard to say because it's a 24-hour game depending on where you are. But about 12 hours before this show, uh, local chat went berserk and went out for about 12 hours. And that uh, caused a lot of... Uh, consternation because fleets couldn't really do their usual thing. If you don't have local, you're at a disadvantage. Uh, so not only uh, that, my yeah. fleet formed up and had no fleet chat. You couldn't talk to the rest of your fleet. Wow. It was, yeah, there was. That so, was by far the worst uh, example of the chat system going down, I think, in the last 10 months. We've had previous situations where you've seen local go down and then Jita was busted for a couple of weeks, but I don't I don't recall there ever being a time where every single chat channel in the game, including fleet chat and all the player created chats, were down at the same time. So that this was a big deal. Well, let's talk about local chat and what that actually means. Uh, I'll just start this off, and then we can um, discuss this and uh, talk about how many casualties there were and things like that. Um, but local chat in this game is was supposed to be like any other MMO. When this game was built, um, well, actually, Carneros can probably speak to this a lot better than I can, but I've noticed in many MMOs that there's always like a global chat and a local chat. Is this just kind of typical? Yeah, it, back, in the, back in the really early days, you could talk to the whole server at the same time through global chat. It was crazy. Uh, um, Meridian 59, Ultima Online, back like back in the day, back in the day. So there's some kind of legacy of expectations in some ways written into the MMORPG dev culture. Right. And for those that don't remember, EVE Online started in 2003. So it was probably in development like in 2001. Uh, so I think it took two, three years to actually make it to beta. Uh, so all the structures were based on what was going on in the late 90s and early 2000s. So you have this thing called local chat. Everybody knows what it is, but um, what it also does is serve as an intelligence tool for a person to know who's around them and who can actually attack them and kill them. So without uh, local chat, um, you are flying blind as to what's around you unless you're using an actual scanner on your ship which you would have to trigger and it looks around and, and tells you like what's around you um so you're kind of flying blind and you're uh, a lot more vulnerable to people especially in less populated areas and we know that in wormholes uh, the we have what's called a delayed local which means that you don't see anybody in local at all unless they make themselves seen by talking in that chat channel. So, uh, at least, can I ask you um, to kind of tell us about local and like how important it is and stuff? 
Yeah, so uh, local, it not only lets you see the bad guys that are in system, but it also, if you are one of the roaming bad guys, it lets you see if there are any uh, targets in the system. So if you're roaming through someone's space trying to, to you know, shake their, their farms a little bit, uh, you can jump into local, see if there's anyone in there worth going for. You kind of, if you roam the same areas of space, you kind of remember certain names and you know what they fly or you know if they just sit AFK all day. And so that allows you to, <clears throat> uh, like a local allows you in that respect to, to see your targets a little bit quicker uh, without having to go to every little area of space. Because you can only scan 14 AU around your ship. And sometimes you have to inspect to see if those ships are just AFK out of Citadel or anything like that. So it really that, does help uh, get targets as well. And then, oh, you can go, Carnaros. But the 12 hour outage last night was not just local. That was all chat channels were screwed up. Um, yeah. the, a favorite channel in a lot of areas of space is the local uh, Intel channel, the place where each person shares what they see happening in space around them to let them people know about danger. And those weren't working. I was I had tried to connect in multiple accounts to the same Intel channel. And I would reply, report what I, what little I could see on one side, and my alts couldn't see it. So I knew yeah, it wasn't that working. was the uh, that was the grim part of of yesterday, right? Because there was no way of communicating in the game worked. Uh, you had to rely completely on out of game communications, and even then, uh, Eve, you know, is, is kind of known for uh, adding a lot of structure outside of the game, but having to rely on that uh, totally was. <laughs> Uh, a, a bit eye-opening for quite a few people yesterday as we saw a lot of people just get murked in local. And I was reading on the, the EVE subreddit, everyone was like, oh, these are clearly bots. I mean, some of them were bots, but most of them were just people that had no idea they were about to get attacked. Like, exactly. <laughs> getting caught exactly. while PVEing, like losing your, uh, your BNI doesn't mean you were a bot. It just means that you got caught by like a, an interceptor that you had no idea was coming. And we we generally, at least uh, in the Imperium on Saturday nights, Karma Fleet runs Saturday nights form, and basically we go around and we go through catch, and and we were sitting on Brave staging in, in GE Tech. They didn't know we were there, so they were feeding random ships coming through all the time. We killed a three build Astero. That there was no reason why we should ever have caught. They should never have even been there, but nobody knew who was in system or where they were unless they were physically on grid looking, uh, and we were able to do a lot of stuff. And I think if you look around, a lot of different areas. Last night, rattlesnakes were dying like they were going out of style. VNIs were dying like they were going out of style. There were a lot of folks out ratting, at least didn't realize, or at least, or they might have been bots. And we can talk about uh, how the bots work as well. But uh, it was it was pretty devastating for for a lot of these areas. And I think it was great. A lot of people died, and I think that's one of the reasons why you see a push from some folks to say let's get rid of local as an intel tool because it does make the game a little more risky, makes it a little more fun for hunters, makes it a little more dangerous for folks that are out mining, or and, and, and makes it harder to, to AFK the game, which I think everybody really doesn't like. Yeah, but as you were mentioning, uh, like the people that died, they didn't necessarily die because there was no local. They died because they couldn't use uh, in-game chat channels to relay the danger of a certain area or something. Correct. There was no intel from, from the in-game in chat channels. That's, that's mainly a null sec thing. Uh, the other thing is just coordinating a fleet when you can't link things like destinations or warp twos or people that you want to anchor, uh, somebody to add to a watch list, something along those lines. It makes it very, very difficult to run a fleet. Uh, when Amen. We were out. We were out, we were out uh, and it was out on a whaling fleet prior to the chat channel going down. And then around 2 a.m., I guess 0200 Eve time is when everything started going downhill. And it became very difficult for us to coordinate and it took about an extra 45 minutes for us to get home because everybody was trying to make sure we we caught everybody everybody was caught up nobody got lost we knew where we were going and it, it really makes you realize how much you rely on these chat channels which we've all taken for granted because they've been a mainstay of mmos for 20 years the problem too is if you've got a really expert group of people if you're nc dot or pl or something in a fleet um all of your guys can probably get by just by looking at the broadcasts coming through in the fleet broadcast window. If you're in a fleet coordinating, you can send certain things with button pushes in the game that show up in the UI. And that was working fine last night, even without a fleet chat channel. 
The problem is, is that no one who's confused can ask you a question or a clarification, or if anyone joins the fleet late after the broadcast went out, they can't ask anything because there's no fleet chat. So it was very hard to move your fleet around. And the last thing you want is a bunch of random guys asking the same stupid question over and over again in comms. It's the quickest way to make the FC want to kill you. Uh, so it makes it very hard to, to communicate. And that just, it, it was not acceptable. Yesterday was not acceptable. Well, that it's nice to be a social game. It kind of brings up a, uh, well, interestingly enough, maybe because of situations like this, uh, the big thing in the EVE Online, the culture is to have your communication separate from the actual game client because it crashes or uh, because these kinds of things happen. So you're always on comms separately. I noticed that right away. Well, actually, many games are like that. Um, but EVE especially, a lot of your comms and organization tools and all that are completely separate from the game so that uh, the game's client doesn't uh, interfere with your ability to communicate with one another. The one area where that's not true is local chat and these chat channels. And if they were all going down, it's kind of like flying blind uh, or 50% blind in, in the game, which kind of begs the question, is, is chat, chat's really meant to communicate with one another and to talk. It's not meant to be although it is, a low, you know, a, uh, an intelligence tool to know what's around you. Uh, and this just kind of seems like it highlights how, how, how antiquated this system is where you're relying on chat to figure out who's around you instead of, say, structures or other kinds of game mechanics. And that's true. But I think, you know, this is another example of Eve's emergent gameplay where, you know, you, people take advantage of the systems that are provided in ways that the developers may not have intended. And I think Local's a perfect example of that. But I mean, we've had we've had plenty of talk. I, I campaigned last year on on making Local less of an Intel tool. I know that that's an internal discussion that, that CCP has had for a long time, not just recently, but it's been, been a conversation. I mean, Hilmar has said it himself that he didn't expect uh, local to be used as the Intel tool that it was. So I think that's something that they're going to look at. But in the, in the meantime, um, we have a, we have this legal doctrine. I'm a lawyer uh, on the side, uh, in addition to being an internet spaceship politician. In real life or in space life? In real life, amazing. <laughs> uh, although I, I do I do represent Pando uh, uh, in his um, uh, <laughs> trademark infringement case against uh, <laughs> yeah. Pro God Legend as a test. For the right. Stuka fleet, but getting back to my point, there, there's a there's a, a philosophy in contract law called promissory estoppel. And that basically means when when someone has relied upon something that you promised to provide to their detriment, and you've reneged on that promise, they've got a cause of action. And that's something that's happened here. Is essentially, we have gotten used to the fact that local works, and local is an Intel tool, and we're going to use it that way. And when it's not there, it's like somebody's yanked the rug out from under us. And I think. People are, are justifiably angry that we've been having these kinds of chat problems for the last 10 months. And I think it's time for CCP to step up and fix this. Uh, it, it should have happened 10 months ago, but, but you know, I understand what they were trying to do. Uh, Dunk Dinkle, who we should really drag onto the show at some point, uh, was saying it's not just local, but it's all channels. And that, I think, is new, is, isn't it? Like, I, have, I haven't seen this many channels go out at the same time. I've seen fleet chat break and I've seen local break, but this is the first time I've seen literally every other channel break too. Oh, it was crazy. I mean, all the player created channels were down. I mean, to the point that the names weren't even there. It was saying player created slash number, uh, a jumble of numbers. I mean, for the first time I've ever seen, I was inputting things into fleet chat and they were going gray with a slash undelivered next to them. Like it was a text message. I've never seen that in 13 years of playing Eve. It's like so, the chat uh, program crazy. just got drunk and fell off its bar stool. <laughs> I was looking to see if there was like a DDoS attack on uh, AWS and Island or something because it, it it didn't make sense that this would all just die at the same time, and nothing they did fixed it until uh, until downtime this morning. Well, this comes at an interesting time because I think recently uh, CCP said that look we're we're actually thinking of rolling back this change that we made because. We presume the reason that these are like, local has been pretty steady for a long, long time, but they went and changed to a new technology and offloaded this. Um, does anyone can anyone speak intelligently on what they did and how they might reverse it? As as I understand it, as it was explained to me, the goal of moving the chat system off of the Eve server was basically to help increase performance of the game client, and that's by basically taking away a system that could be outsourced to uh, a cloud-based uh, system somewhere else 
that didn't have to reside on the server. It would help the game move a little quicker and, and take a little bit of pressure off the, off the blades that were running EVE uh, in general. So what they ended up doing was they migrated to an outside client uh, that's run through Amazon Web Services in Ireland. Uh, and it was supposed to be this great system is going to take everything off. And, and it was scalable. As more people got in there, more, more stuff would go online, those types of things. It just it has never worked right. Um, and I believe CCP Darwin noted on the forums that the problem is not with the chat load. It can ha- the servers can handle the load. What they can't handle is the constant switching of chat servers in the game that happens every time you jump through a system. And that's why Jita, for example, was always going offline was because the number of jumps into no, no, there are no, no, no system in the game has many, as many jumps going into it as Jita does. So people were constantly changing chat servers and it just couldn't keep up. Yeah, so we shall see. So this isn't just about, um, you know, CCP screwing up and local is messed up. That happens, but the the effects of it were kind of funny. So <laughs> I think especially with um, VNIs, which are VEX or Navy issue ships that are used for uh, what's basically AFK ratting, um, most of those, <laughs> I mean, we saw those numbers uh, quadruple or at least triple. Um, did anybody, anybody notice that? I mean, it's pretty crazy. If you look at the numbers, and McLeod did some math for us, uh, between 2100 and 100 EVE last night, this is before the chat server went down, uh, there were about 16 losses per hour, about 50 losses of VNIs across the server. Once the chat system went down, that number skyrocketed. There were 523 over the next 12 hours. That was about, that turned into approximately 43 losses an hour. So, a lot of folks either didn't get the message or set their bots up to run and didn't bother checking on them and didn't realize that that the, the servers were down. And and that that kind of turned into this VNI holocaust that we saw last night, which I thought was great. It was uh, <laughs> it was pretty amusing to watch the, the kills coming in on Z-Kill. I, I, this reminds me of a time when um, Autopilot screwed up and ran a bunch of freighters, including myself, through LOSEC and... I, I thought initially, oh, I screwed up. How could I screw up autopilot? I must have uh, said, get me there the fastest way, not the safest way. Um, so I was kind of mad at myself until I realized there were all kinds of freighters dying around me. And uh, the pirates were just having a field day. It was like a bird bath with a bunch of uh, spa- swallows, you know, jumping around. And um, it turns out that it was, a, you know, some kind of a break in the autopilot. And I think they did reimburse ships. Um, but it's still, you know, it was a hell of a time for for pirates. So I'm sure people who were tracking down VNIs uh, last night were having a field day. Yeah, I remember the yeah. uh, that thing when they they accidentally set all of the the new defaults for the uh, autopilot would be to take the uh, the shortest route instead of the safest route. And back then, going through to to Jita, you would have to go through Ranser if you wanted to go the short route. So everyone just started going through Ranser and just dying horribly. <laughs> You remember that? That was, yeah, I was, I was one of those. People guys. do use autopilot, though. You're, I see that in chat. People asking. I, st- I still remember going when I worked at CCP, going by CCP Soundwave's desk, so that he, in between meetings, so that he could click again for his freighters that were going back across HiSec. Like, You're autopiloting freighters through HiSec. No one ever shoots me. You'd be surprised. But he used to do it all the time. <laughs> well, yeah, it's usually, That's crazy. It's usually safe. Um, Man, this was before you would, uh, I don't know, there a lot of quality, quality of life changes to autopilot. So you couldn't like see your next destination necessarily in like the colors and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So. And you couldn't, you could only pilot to the system. You couldn't pilot into a dock. You had to like, so you had to like say, okay, this will take a half hour to get to Jita, but I can't be sitting there in Jita floating with this cargo. So in 30 minutes, I got to make it back to my computer to dock. And sometimes you wouldn't make it. The struggle. Mm, yeah. Little things. All right. So um, the future of local, uh, Brisk, you kind of brushed on it. Um, do we know what they're going to decide and when? I don't think that there's anything uh, imminent uh, in, in regards to that change. I think a lot of this is just us talking. Um, 
A, a lot of it is just ideas. By us talking, you mean CSM talking? I, I mean CSM. I know I know CCP has brought it up, but it's not something that I think is on the radar, at least in the, in the immediate future. Uh, some of the ideas that I've seen that I like, something along the lines of for high sec and low sec, leave it the same, but in null sec, uh, make it delayed based on either the ADMs in the system or require an infrastructure hub upgrade that gives you instant local, something that could be in TOSIS or knock down. Uh, that 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 make just to make it a little bit harder. Uh, I spent a lot of time in, in wormholes the last month or so uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, and I, I like it in there because not having the local it means you got to pay attention and it means you got to have a little more heads up play. And I think that at least for those of us who who play in nullsec who seem to think we are the creme de la creme of PVPers in the game, uh, local's a big crutch, and I'd love to see that crutch get taken away or at least modified. Uh, but I know that that's not not a hundred percent popular concept, but we'll see uh, how it plays out. Yeah, getting rid of local is is like great idea in theory. You're like, oh well, people have to be uh, you know have to to fight in a different way. They have to rely on scouts more, yada yada. But also, uh, the, one of the big problems, not necessarily problems, but one of the big issues that makes it so such a uh, complicated issue to to even consider removing local is that a lot of people. Just rely on just seeing those numbers as a means to decide if they're going to fight or not, you know. So for the large yep. fleets, obviously, you always have someone in, in the enemy's local scanning. So who cares? You just copy that D scan and you see the exact numbers. But for the medium or small scale fights or even getting into the like the 100 plus fights, People don't want to be uh, don't want to go into the unknown. You know, Eve players are, are very. Uh, er everyone wants to win. I should put it that way. No one wants to be at an immediate disadvantage when they start a fight. And local is one of the tools that helps you know gauge how successful your fight is going to be. In addition to that, one of the things that I kept hearing when Jita was down was players who were coming back to the game or who had taken a break and wanted to see how things were going, they'd log in, they'd go to JITA. That's the main hub system. There's usually 15 to 2,000 people in there at any time, and they were seeing like 60 or 100. And their response was, oh my God, is Eve dying? Because there's nobody here. It's because nobody knew how many folks were in system because the chat system wasn't working. Yeah, I found myself uh, in JITA a few times uh, just talking to myself in local chat because it was such a surreal feeling being able to see something I typed in JITA local. Without it, not like, get scrolling. flooded with with spam, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's no one that uh, I, no one would double uh, my ISK. It was terrible. All right, <clears throat> so we're um, uh, so it, it's over now, and chat is now back to normal, and local chat especially. But uh, just to recap, all the channels where you could text in the game went out, and that had uh, derivative effects because those channels are not just used to communicate with one another. Uh, they're also used in strange ways as intelligence gathering mechanisms. So it was very much flying in the dark for a lot of people. And um, extremely vulnerable ships were the Vexor Navy issues, the VNIs, and they were killed for three or four times their normal rate uh, all at once within those 12 hours. So very interesting, uh, but it, it is kind of a philosophical discussion because it brings up local, what is local, um, should it be relied upon the way it is in the game, or should we have scanners that are built in that are, you know, a different mechanic altogether than the chat channels? So we'll we'll uh, revisit this as CCP revisits it. I think by the fifteenth, they're going to make a decision on either rolling back to the old chat system, which might slow the game down a little bit, or sticking with the new one and trying to fix it. Yeah, I think uh, from from the null sector's perspective, at least, or from the people that fight in the the larger battles. I think people are happier to have a little bit more time dilation and a chat system that will always work. I don't know if that's true for different areas of space, but that's uh, when I ask people about it, that's kind of the, the genuine, genuine feel I get. And I agree with that. And I think the, the, the problem really has been that the chat up until 10 months ago when they made this change was, was one of the rock solid legacy systems in EVE that you really could count on. I mean, other than uh, hiccups every once in a while, as Elise mentioned, with uh, you know, fleet chat not working or things along those lines, chat never went down. It was a standard thing. You could expect it and you could rely on it. And that's why a lot of these groups have, have come to do that. And I find it's, it's just, to me, it's, it's completely unacceptable to have 
a basic fundamental staple thing that MMOs have been doing since the very, very beginning. I mean, even EverQuest and Ultima, had, they had chat systems. You know, you have to in an MMO because that's part of the, the socialized nature of the game. Having that not work is just not acceptable and CCP needs to fix it. And the other thing I'd say is I'm, I'm pleased to see the willingness to take such a big step as rolling back this system because that's not something I, I think you would have seen a couple of years ago from CCP. They would have forced, they would have pushed this forward and said, We're, we'll fix it, we'll make it work. But they would not have said, all right, we can tell this is not working, we're gonna roll it back. That's a big deal. And I give them credit for being willing to do that. But I'd also, I also wanna manage expectations because it sounds to me from what I've been hearing internally, um, this is not gonna be a seamless process and it may take some time because there's been 10 months of iteration on the chat system uh, and if we go back, we're going to go back to a system that was last March that a lot of people didn't like with chat bubbles and those types of things potentially that are going to be in there. So uh, if they do go that route, and I, I encourage them to do so because I think it's necessary at this point, mm -hmm. um, folks are going to have to be patient. Well, Del Norin, also, um, let, me, let me just squeeze this in. Del Norin, the master, says a broken chat equals turn off the game until fixed. It's, it's, it's pretty, that kind of highlights the importance. Uh, go ahead, Elise. I was just gonna say one of the uh, one of the interesting things, or one of the the small knockoff effects of the new chat system, uh, which I'm not sure a lot of people get to deal with, is it changed all of the permissions for the uh, channel owners and stuff like that. Absolutely, yep. yep. So they're gonna have to swap that back, which will be pretty interesting because I'm not, I have no idea how they're going to. Um, but for if you're in an, uh, a group that's existing for a long time, for example, like PL, we've been around for for quite a few years. All of our chat channels have owners that no longer play the game. And oh. that usually wasn't a, a problem, right? Because operators would be able to add new operators. And who cares about the owners? When uh, the new chat system came in last year, um, the, they kind of axed all that. So now only the owners can add uh, new operators. And operators can't really do anything to moderate the uh, channels. So uh, there's quite a few PL channels uh, that we... We're considering changing just because uh, we couldn't really get new operators in there. We had the same exact problem. We had to rename a bunch of our standard chats that everybody knew uh, because the owners were gone or had left uh, and were AFK. It's, it's just it's not good when changes like this happen, especially when they're done to legacy systems. Yeah, if somebody has, uh, we we're looking at talking in stations, uh, the in-game channel, and none of my alts seem to have the ownership of that channel. So if somebody has that out there, if you're squatting it, let's talk. Because <laughs> uh, I would like to. Stage. Yeah, let's talk. There's some money-making opportunities here. He'll yeah. double your risk. I'm willing to entertain being extorted for the, yeah, anyway. Um, but uh, that is very interesting. Would be the first like time. Critical problem for other players to to lose control of stations. Uh, sorry, channels. That's That would be wild. Um, okay, anything else on this that uh, we didn't cover? I didn't think so. A lot of stuff came out that was above and beyond what I expected to talk about. That was going to be a quick little introduction, <laughs> but there's a lot of mileage in local. All right, let's move on to January patch notes. This was covered on the midweek show with Artemis uh, and the guys. Um, but um, did you guys see anything in these January patch notes that needs discussing? I went and, and looked on Test Center to see some of the new interface stuff. Um, which I can talk about in a minute, but did you guys see anything that jumped out at you? There were a uh, few tidbits, but I want—I do want to give up the some insider baseball to the crowd listening today. There's a gal on our team, our staff for Talking Stations named January. So we all giggle when she has her patch notes uh, and we all think about her each time we talk about these patch notes. Okay, let's go <laughs> on to business. The January patch notes. There, there were a couple of things that I noted in there. I think the first mm -hmm. was that this was not a release with any real new content, uh, which I liked. I think this this was more about fixing bugs and, and doing those types of things. And I think that's a good start of the year kind of thing. Um, every time, one of the things you constantly hear, and I've heard on the CSM, you see it on Reddit all the time, it's stop adding new things, just fix the game. So when I see a January patch note full of bug fixes and, and little little things, as CCP Carker would say, that makes me happy. Uh, but the one thing that did jump out at me that I liked was the uh, they nerfed the drone implants that they just added. 
they no longer will, will apply to, to fighters. Uh, I think a lot of folks who, who were using them and their carriers and their supercarriers are going to be a little upset with that. Uh, I think it's. I think it was necessary, but I, I think that was that was a, a pretty big change that uh, jumped off the page at me when I saw that. Yeah, that's the huge gameplay uh, change because those things they would have been just completely overpowered and basically mandatory for for every super capital pilot. And absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting. This has kind of followed Microsoft's TikTok model where they'll release a bunch of content and then they'll go back and do a polish. And I mean, they'll add in some art, um, things like the change that they're making to asteroids having a better, you know, sort of prettier breakdown process as you mine the, the rocks down. But really, this was a, a talk refresh. It was an opportunity to go in and clean up the microarchitecture and, and fix some small bug issues. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, as Briss was saying, there's a lot of players that are like, oh, we don't want anything new. We just want to fix all the bugs that are existing. That's all well and good until you actually start doing that because CCB did that for a while and everyone was like, man, this is boring. Nothing new is coming out. Like, just balance yeah, certain no things. balances. Yeah, balances. This sucks. So, yeah. Here, they had a lot to fix. Like, a lot of the old legacy code that had to come out, things like walking around stations and other things, um, have uh, were holding us up from having a 64-bit client. And they had to pull all that stuff out. And that's a lot of work. Yeah, it is. It is. The the big thing that I saw from this thing, other than the uh, the changes to the uh, implants, is that the activity tracker can now be open in Windows mode, which is great. Oh, my God. Started. That was so good. I used you to know, open I, it up and it would just take over my whole screen and I'd, get, I'd, I'd almost die a few times. Yeah, I almost died on the gate. Um, okay. This there was like no way to get it off because all you could see was like your head and you couldn't yeah. see anything else. And I mean, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but... I mean, the average e player plays on multiple monitors, and I've got everything set in fixed window, and you just couldn't see anything. It was like, ah, fix it. And it, I, and I remember it worked okay. At least it seemed like it worked okay when they showed it to us in Iceland. So I was surprised that uh, it didn't work. So I'm very happy to see they got that fixed. Hmm. Yeah. And so for those that don't know, it it looks like the map now, where you can you know move it to the right side, move it to the left side. It'll take over like a third of your screen. Uh, or you can make it full screen again if you want to. But it's all optional now, and it starts out in window mode. So it's, it works just like the map does now. Uh, another thing that's worth talking about is a little thing, and that is uh, not long ago, maybe just a couple of months, they put in uh, an Omni search uh, that is just a little search box in the top left of the game that allows you to search any term, and it'll look up a person, place, or thing. And, and then you can get more information from that. Well, that now has an improvement to it. It carries a memory with it, just like, uh, say, contracts. When, uh, when you're doing repetitive stuff, you don't have to retype the whole thing again. So if you were to type in tritanium correctly the first time, uh, when, you start, uh, when you start typing the next uh, time, it'll go ahead and autofill if you type in TRI. So that might be a little time saver. And I want to toot CSM Horn in that regard because that that universal search was Steve Raducan's idea, and I don't think he gets enough credit for it. And uh, it was a huge thing, and everybody loves that. So give it up for here, Steve here. for getting that it is, done. Especially when it comes to helping out new bros, that is a huge help to be able to say rather than having to go, you know, go click on your map and then click in the top right corner. Okay, now type it out. I can just say go to universal search and type Jita. Yeah, I think that also doubles as a glossary if you think about it, um, because if there's a term you don't know and you type it in, now for some things, right, like there's some stuff that's player made, but if there's something you want to know more about, you're just a few clicks away from the information panel that will describe it you know, for you. And I think that that's an unintended additional, uh, I wouldn't call it a consequence, but bonus uh, effect. Yeah, it's great. And you can, you can uh, it's kind of like the radial menu for... Uh, when you try and target something, you'll be able to see when people start using that how old they are because older players will just type it into local chat, select all, and then just right click and try and uh, do the auto link thing, which is what I always did when I was trying to find a system. And it was yeah. super obnoxious and, and convoluted. So I'm trying to force myself into using uh, the universal search. Yeah, I call that kind of thing the uh, arcane knowledge of older players, the uh, wizards that have been around a long time. Uh, the little tips and tricks. Well, uh, cool. So January patch notes, there's also uh, some graphical stuff. The uh, looks like the 
more effects on mining. Um, if you're looking at an asteroid and destroying it, it won't just disappear. I think it'll actually get red hot and disappear or something. Looks pretty cool. Um, they fix an issue where wormholes will sometimes not correctly expire over downtime. Now, that is a, another huge thing that mm -hmm. the wormhole guys have been complaining about for a while. Random stuff would just happen with some of these wormholes where they would they would just disappear or they would at, at your statics would move around oddly after downtime. Uh, and it's something I, I know that they were looking at. I'm happy they finally got that addressed because I know that was a big issue for the wormhole people. I really hope, uh, sorry, on a, on a breakaway, it looks like the EVE updates site is down in addition to a couple of other resources. So I'm wondering if maybe chat being down isn't connected to something like a five channel wildcard cert or something breaking on CCP's end. Uh, but yeah, it's looking like there's more than one service down right now. Oh, interesting. I don't uh, know what you said, but it sounded smart. <laughs> Many um, quality of life changes in this patch. And uh, one last thing, Sasha Nations attempted to expand its borders into the Serpentis Drug Outlet Dead Space Complex, uh, but the Guardian Angels caught them and put a stop to it. The errant Sasha NPCs in the Serpentis Drug Outlet have been replaced by the correct Serpentis NPCs. And that looks like a little bit of um, an adjustment to the environment and lore and um, yeah. Other than that, there's just quality of life changes and uh, shouldn't be too disruptive a patch. Oh, also apparently uh, I had no idea, but apparently Thera wasn't working right when it came to uh, reprocessing taxes. So apparently that that's fixed. <laughs> that's kind of funny. Oh no, for Volta, they just moved there, right? Yeah. You know, you broke that on the, the show last week, and I didn't appreciate uh, how important that was. They had left Skill U, and uh, they're going to Thera to kind of return to, say, Roots, where they're more, um, they're not a wormhole group, but they use wormholes to gain advantage in attacking different parts of the map, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. So it was actually Headliner that broke the news, because Ron was uh, uh, mentioning how viable it was to be someone that lived in a wormhole and just use that to explore and uh, raid other areas of space. I was like, hey, really, the only people that ever did it was Volta, and they stopped. And then Headliner was like, oh, no, they're actually moving back. So there they go, which is good, because they were, and I guess now are, the best at doing that. Yeah, and, now, and, then, and then after the show, it broke, I guess, on uh, Reddit, maybe as a consequence to hearing it said here. Um, but then it became bigger news, and then... You know, that became a question as to what, what happened between Volta and Skill U. Are they just, you know, bored of that lifestyle or is something going on inside of uh, Skill U? So, so that was good. That was very interesting. We'll see what, what happens there. Yeah, I have a feeling it was just boredom if we want to just draw on it for a little bit. But yeah, I'm pretty sure they were just mm -hmm. like, eh, we, we had a goal to take this area of space. We got it. Now there's nothing really happening. So let's go do something else. That tends to be, that tends to be what happens with, uh, well, I guess higher than Everest. That's why uh, the culture kind of collapsed. They wanted to go have some fun and they weren't yeah. having much fun. And uh, Volta could be the same. Uh, it seems like Snuff was the exact same thing. So that, those medium sized groups that are like full of active people who want to fight all the time and, and do stuff, uh, if, if very susceptible to boredom. Yeah, yeah it seems like this January has been, the, has been a lot quieter than usual for some reason. I don't know if that's that's your guys' opinion, but it just seems like, other than the test stuff that we saw last week and, and, and on Thursday, it just seems like January's been very quiet. It's weird. Yeah, at least were you uh, going to finish something? Yeah, no, no. I mean, okay. probably, but I'm sure it's <laughs> But it's gone. Yeah. So, sorry, Elise. I'm used to open was, comms where I just talk over everybody. Yeah, op open no, comms, you have to throw idea. elbows to get some time in there. Um, all right, well... Um, well, picking up on that, though, Brisk, uh, January is usually one of the loudest and most active months in EVE Online. That's when all the big battles happen. Uh, this, this time, it seems like a lot of the stuff that's heating up is over um, with, between Test and Horde, principally. Uh, we have Pandemic, Legion, and uh, Northern Coalition backing up Horde. And you have some Imperium SIGs backing up Test. And so at any moment, that could really turn into something. But... Um, there have been exchanges there 
where mostly test has run a bunch of uh, dreadnoughts up. Uh, and, and it's an exact opposite situation that they had with PL. When PL didn't bring their super fleet down to fight in test's territory, they really only brought dreadnoughts. Those dreadnoughts actually ended up getting uh, killed uh, pretty easily by the defending super capital fleet. And now you have the reverse situation where test is up in the north and PL is killing their dread fleets, dreadnought fleets, in uh, relatively easily with their super capitals. So it's kind of interesting how it's, uh, you know, a year later, it's, it's the shoe is on the other foot. Yeah, and I think part of the reason is it's not a matter of hubris, right? Like, I don't think ProGuard was like, hey, uh, PL sucks. We can do this way better. I think it's just a matter of wanting to have a deployment that's not on their own, uh, you know, not a defensive deployment, right? Because uh, all these defensive campaigns, uh, they're kind of annoying. They're very limiting to what you can do. And it also stops you, uh, like, building up your space, which is something that I know uh, the Tappy guys want to do. They want to... They want to have, you know, pride in in their uh, in the monthly economic report. They want to be able to say, "Ha, ah, we're getting close to to delve, or we're we're making a dent." And the best way to do that is just take an offensive campaign. You have stuff that your members can do. You can PvP. You might get uh, slapped in the face a few times and lose a few dreads, but who cares? That's what SRP is for. That's why you you tax your your ratters and stuff like that. So it's just a fun way to get people motivated. Uh, and uh, you know, give them give them a little bit of action. Well, uh, one one of the chat members, Spectral Freeman, um, remind based that if your group's not doing something, it seems quiet out there. But in reality, there's a lot of people doing a lot of different things, and there may be plans in the works and all that kind of stuff. Um, Nullsec isn't the only play style. There's certainly many more, including. Uh, wormhole space and a lot of stuff that happens in low sec and even high sec now is a very exciting place. Uh, we're probably going to have a show dedicated to the changes in high sec. I think it was Ash Dorothy said, um, high sec is now where new players should be because before long ago it was right. Cause you jump into high sec and you kind of acclimate and then you tiptoe into low sec and play with the danger and the excitement level. And then eventually you graduate to work for a coalition in NullSec or an alliance in NullSec. And then eventually you become a veteran of that sort of lifestyle. And that's the normal progression long ago. But that got turned on its head at around 2000 and say 11 or 12, where uh, people said, let's just get to the fun part and put you right into these big groups and we'll just fly whatever and we'll die and it'll be fun and hilarious. And so there's a few groups that were like that. And I'm looking at test and I'm thinking of the alternative Brave uh, that kind of came up. And then those split into groups like, well, test remained the same, but you had a Pandemic Horde and you had Karma Fleet. And they were all um, groups for newbies that were protected by established powers. Pandemic Horde kind of protected by Pandemic Legion and NC. And you had uh, Karma Fleet uh, was a part of Goon Swarm and the Imperium. So they were kind of fostered into their, it's like a little training school. But so when you came in, you were kind of ushered right into the deep end, right into null sec. And you kind of skipped over this whole low sec and especially high sec lifestyle. But it seems like high sec is really um, the new place to go. And, and here's why the way Ashtarathi explained it that NullSec used to be the safest place to go because you have safety in numbers and you're harvesting at the highest rates. Why wouldn't you do that sort of thing? And HiSec, uh, you were subject to all kinds of punishing war declarations and ganking. Uh, so it was, it, was not, it was not stable and most people were smaller and more uh, alone. And so the expectation of safety was just intermittent and you never knew if you were or weren't and that made it even worse. But now that that's all changed, where you cannot be uh, war decked or declared war on uh, if you do not own a structure, that gives you 100% safety. Uh, not 100%, actually, you can still be ganked, but it gives you a greater measure of safety in high sec, which makes that a lot more attractive as a place to really start up again. But and, uh, we'll, yeah, we'll just have a show to, on to and talk about that. Dovetail on your point a little bit. One of the in most interesting facets of the uh, 
you know, the rise of the, the new player groups and stuff like that. So I, I credit a lot of that to Brave Newbies. They were like the first uh, guys in frigates that just, they'd go out and they did not care at all. I remember <laughs> I was in somewhere in Losec and there was this guy in a battleship. He was just shooting two or three Atrons from this group that I'd never heard of before called Brave Newbies. And then out comes 70 other Atrons. And this guy kills like 40 of the Atrons, but he ends up dying anyways <laughs> because he just gets <laughs> swarmed by these. And a lot of that is, it's not only because of, of Brave Newbies, but because of this one just random balance pass that I remember CCB Fozzie's team worked on and they just made frigates a little bit better, right? So they just made them worthwhile. So all right. of a sudden, these new players in these one month or two month old frigates could have a huge impact, whether if it's an Atron just providing tackle or a Griffin or a Crucifier providing Ewar, all those things were like hugely important. And very impactful. So it was really neat to see that small little balance change have this massive uh, effect in the the Eve world. Yeah, when when CCP Fozzy uh, first joined up, um, he and CCP Rise, who are now veterans, right? When they first joined up, they took on balancing uh, pretty early on in their career there at CCP, and they they really revitalized T1 ships, uh, and it was almost as big as any patch, uh, even though it was, a, you know, just a, a feature change, just a balance pass, but they really brought back to life all these T1 hulls, especially cruisers and uh, frigates. Um, and I believe battle cruisers, uh, no, battle cruisers might have been having just a small adjustment after they were introduced. But I remember the cruiser changes were huge. Yeah, suddenly you don't have a bunch of uh, useless ships because before it would be like, Two frigates were good, and then the rest were garbage. Like, five or six cruisers were good, and the rest are garbage. And now it's like every other one can actually work in a certain situation. Like, there is a way that you can get a, an Atron to be super successful. You can have a Mollus be incredibly useful. You can have an Arbitrator work for PvP. It's completely nuts. And that's great for the, the new players that are starting, particularly the Alpha accounts that don't have a lot of skill points is that there are a variety of ships that they can use and still be effective, even in big fleets. Uh, and I think that that's a that was a design goal, and I think that has been achieved, so I'm very pleased with that. Yeah, and also uh, we, we did mention that January was pretty quiet, uh, and, and someone in chat did bring them to the point that, hey, it's quiet for Nelsec, it's not quiet for everyone. Uh, there was, I think, probably the largest, um, uh, the fleet for uh, PVEers happened uh, either yesterday or the day before. Uh, there was like 10 Bill and Iska killed. It was over a, uh, uh, a Citadel somewhere in Losec. And there were like 150 people involved in like the Amar role players versus the Minmatar role players. And then some like third party guys snuck in there a little bit. It was super nifty. Um, uh, Baleful Dysnomia is the one that uh, I follow her on Twitch and, and Twitter and stuff. She's a uh, Amar role player, also a streamer, also beat me in the. Uh, Amar Championships, which I don't Sorry, who was that? Uh, her name is Baleful Dysnomia. And uh, she's uh, in, in Pi, the, the Amar role playing group that's allied with CVA. And yeah, there was like a 150 person fight in uh, the Becca over a Citadel that were all our peers were involved. So it's probably the biggest one for, for a long time. That's pretty cool. I like to see wow. that. Um, <clears throat> Pi is kind of a f one of the oldest corporations in New Eden, isn't it? I think it, it's it's really close to to one of the oldest. They've played before uh, before Eve was Eve, like while it was still in beta, and then they they formed their corp right after uh, Eve went live, and they've been strict Amar role players for like the longest longest time. Yeah. All right. So Baleful Dysnomia. Nice to hear about her. We're going to wrap this section up and talk about the next section, which is the monthly economic report. I always like to say uh, economics is a huge part of EVE Online, at least the part that attracted me and the complications and the uh, everything being user created and or player created and the exchanges and don't like the scam so much, but I do like just how complex this gets. So to talk us through some of the stuff, um, we have a Jurious Doctor joining us. 
How's it going, Jarius? It's going pretty good. I, I have to say, I love how tied to the identity of Eve that the economics and the spreadsheets are. Um, I was watching a, a video last week from Linus Tech Tips, a new episode, um, and he's a cool guy. He lives local to me. And uh, they were cracking a joke about the the graphics performance of a computer. And they said, well, that's fine if you're playing with spreadsheets. And somebody said, you mean Eve Online? And everybody just kind of smiled. Um, and that made me really laugh. But uh, before I dive into the MER, it's, uh, it's something that doesn't get talked about a lot is the difference in billions. I don't know if you, any of you are familiar with this, but the difference between the UK billion and the US billion? No, there's a difference. Okay. Yeah, so, so a UK billion is 1 million or 1 billion billions, whereas a US billion is 1,000 billions. And to give you a difference for scale, 1 million seconds is 11.6 days. 1 billion seconds is 32 years. 1 UK billion seconds is 32,000 years. Oh my God. So being a billionaire in the UK is like much better than being a millionaire in. Well, the great thing is internationally, they, I think, I'm pretty sure US is the standard. And as far as I know, EVE Online uses Which is how it should be. Correct. It's it's a much easier to understand system. Um, But that said, moving forward, every number I'm about to give you is in US billions. (laughs) I love that little tip. Thanks. Yeah. So overall, sinks and faucets are doing uh, well, but we, as we usually do in December, um, through the months of November, December, we see a big dip in activity. So bounties were down overall 400 billion billions of ISK. Uh, manufacturing agent mission rewards did not appear to fall. And velocity of ISK was down, but not as much as in September, which is very strange. Um, it shows you how many students and people who work in education are playing EVE, that there's a bigger dip in September than in December. Uh, Mineral price, primary producer, and secondary producer indices are all down for the month of December. And the mineral and primary producer prices have been trending down since July. So if you're a trader and you want to buy a stockpile of minerals or get into some primary goods, uh, I would say that now is a good time to start investing because those will likely go up in uh, February. And economic indices, the the PPI, which is the primary uh, producer index, the consumer price index and mineral index are all looking up month over month. So we're starting to see that climb already. The secondary index, which is things like, uh, you know, salvage, rigs, those kinds of things, um, that has more or less held steady. So things are looking good there. But uh, we can say that uh, there is a big difference for the most part between high sec and null sec in terms of activity and moving amounts in the month of December. Trade balance by region fell by <laughs> 4 trillion ISK in Domain, Hymatar, 3.4 in Citadel, one in Metropolis, and one in Lone Track. Like basically all of high sec had a wet blanket thrown over it on December. In Null, we see period basis, Innsmother, Impasse, and Wicked Creek all fall by multiple trillions. And we see trade balance go up, strangely, in Curse, Cobalt Edge, and Essence. Now, Cobalt Edge is pretty clear. Uh, that's Hard Knocks trying to find some space after having their teeth pushed in. Yikes. <laughs> um, but it was interesting to see Red Alliance, Skill Yourself, and Frat, as well as Legacy, see that much loss from their player base uh, in December. So that was a pretty big drop overall. For regions to watch, um, for production, imports, and export, Delve obviously is doing very, very well. Uh, Although mining is down 3.3 trillion ISK in December, but production is up. So I'm guessing they're working through a lot of stockpiles. Uh, Essence has been moving a a lot to loan track. In fact, it's a gigantic number. It's in the trillions of ISK. Um, There's been a lot of goods moving in terms of market trade. And Esoteria, of course, being test. So mining is way up in Esoteria. Uh, Frat has been doing a lot of mining in Deterid and uh, something around the range of a trillion ISK in total market uh, movement and, and mining uh, income. And Catch and Impasse, which is legacy, mining is marginally down, but ratting and everything else is up. Genesis, which is high sec, um, the net exports are hugely up. Like uh, mining is up 130 billion billions, um, but Ratting and NPC bounties are down. So to see an exports in the range of four to five trillion ISK in December from a region that has low activity is really strange. I don't know if that's people moving stuff out of Amar to Jita to try to keep their you know activity up over the month, like try to keep their sales going. Um, but it looks like somebody basically drained Amar's major market and put it somewhere else. 
either that or somebody who's buying a crap ton off the market and just stockpiling like crazy. And in my final notes, the last regions to watch, a lot of regions are down, um, mostly because of the activity being slowing down in December. Fountains activity, for example, where I live, is down across all fronts. Mining, ratting, you name it, it's all down. And the same is true for Geminit. Uh, branch ratting bounties have more than doubled from 2.2 trillion-esque to almost 6 trillion-esque. So if, uh, if you're up there while well, uh, local's not working... It might be a region to look at. Yeah. It's, and that's everything. Thank you, Jarius. <clears throat> There's some things in there that jumped out at me. One is uh, Fraternity is uh, is mining their little hearts out, uh, which makes sense because I think they still have a peace treaty with their enemy test. So they should be able to uh, mine and harvest and build things with a little more security than uh than having a, a threatening enemy really close by. Another thing that kind of jumped out at me was uh, Essence uh, exporting into Lone Trek. I'm trying to figure that out. Is that because Lone Trek borders on the northern part of Nullsec and uh, people are basically selling to those builders? Or I wonder what that. I about. think it's a, a big part of feeding the building people's rebuilding of their of their dread fleets um and and they're using that as an area to carry out those transactions so that is moving market totals that is sales in those regions has has significantly spiked and we see a huge depletion of assets um in essence and a, and a corresponding giant spike in loan track the depletion of assets in essence now essence is the heart of the galente empire right it's actually like the mm -hmm. i call it the acapulco of <laughs> the acapulco of uh, eve in that it's kind of the old cool place to hang out because uh, essence was the trade hub there for a long time until dodixie uh eclipsed it um but what essence is kind of known for host, having factional warfare in its northern part of that region and I wonder if there's been a change in that dynamic that has affected the um, the movement out of uh, assets and minerals. I don't know if that's if that's significant enough to show the scale of change that we're seeing. Um, but I definitely think that there has been a slowdown in faction warfare. I think people are losing their taste for it. I think it's a dying mechanic and that uh, honestly, it either needs a complete overhaul mm -hmm. or that CCP needs to remove it from the game. I was just thinking of getting in. Uh, well, the thing is, they're great systems to hold, but nobody's interested in holding them for the sake of faction warfare. The other yeah. problem is, is that since 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 the Citadel expansion, uh, a lot of the the benefits to flipping systems uh, beyond the increased LP gain that you get is gone because you can't lock out the other guys from from the stations and things along those lines. So, one of the things that I'd push for and we'd ask for was fix find a way to, to fix. Citadel mechanics in faction warfare space because they don't work. Uh, it's too easy for the losing side to just drop a citadel and have a place, safe place to, to dock up. Uh, whereas before they would have to leave the system to find some place to go, uh, and that's frustrating. And I think a lot of the groups that had done faction warfare for a long time uh, have picked up and moved away. And then you've also seen groups like Snuffed move into low sec, uh, and and that's kind of been their new stamping ground. And I think that that kind of has, has made it a little harder for the folks that are in there. Uh, but yeah, I think faction warfare, it's its its time. Uh, it's time for CCP to, to really sit there and, and try to come up with a new system to make it more relevant uh, because it's just not anymore. Other than farming LP for ISK and, and getting VNI blueprints, uh, there's not a whole hell of a lot uh, that folks are really using it for. And it's also becoming a new place for a lot of botting, which I think needs to, to be fixed. Yeah, Faction yeah. Warfare has been like really fun when it comes to, hey, I only have 30 minutes to play EVE. I'm going to go in. I'm going to go in Faction Warfare space, either near like Camella and Thama area or near Amamaki and Camella area. And I'm going to just get a few kills in my frigate or destroyer. Then I'm going to peace out and, and go do whatever I have to do. So that's kind of what Faction Warfare has turned into instead of playing around the mechanics of capturing systems and, uh, and flipping SOV and, and holding systems and stuff like that.
And I think in a big way that's being replaced by abyssal space because the money to be made is actually better from abyssal. Yeah, abyssal PvP is tricky yep. though. It is. Well, we just put out tutorials on abyssal space. If you wanted to uh, make a bunch of money, uh, there are ways to do it. Uh, if you're a skilled pilot and you can multi-box uh, three hawks, you can go all the way up and do the hardest ones there are to do in abyssal. And that is pretty lucrative in that it makes at least 100 million um, per 20 minutes. So that's 300 million per hour. And it can go a lot higher than that, uh, close to maybe a billion, because each of these can net you uh, at sometimes 300 million. Uh, do that, do three of those in an hour, and you've got nearly a billion. So if you wanted to learn that kind of stuff and get into the new content, uh, check out Talking in Stations, uh, January 3rd, where we did, or, or Artemis and the guys uh, did um, a walkthrough and a run through. And they were describing all the kinds of things that you need uh, to do and what kind of ships you need to fly in order to do that. So check that out. That was Talking in Stations, January 3rd. Or actually Season 1, Episode 1. Now that we're doing seasons, we can refer to that. Uh, and that is uh, on uh, talkinginstations.com. You can find it there or go to our YouTube, YouTube channel from there. Okay, cool. So check out that stuff. By the way, midweek episodes that we're doing are fantastic. Check those out too. This is the Sunday show where we discuss what happened during the week and the midweek show kind of gets us an update on what's going on in the middle of the week and also tackles topics. Uh, it's a great show. We're a great show because actually it's all talking in stations and this is our new season format where we're going to do uh, four seasons per year and take breaks in between. So check it out. And if you like any of this stuff, you can always contribute. We like to point that out as well. Now you can contribute right here on Twitch by subscribing. That's new. We didn't think we were going to do it, but uh, Elise convinced us. <laughs> so here it is. You can subscribe to Talking in Stations, uh, the channel, as well as uh, join the Patreons. And all that stuff really helps us out uh, as we go on and make more content. Look at that. Another subscriber. Love it. Okay. Uh, so monthly economic report. Was there anything else in there you guys thought was interesting? What about the... Uh, Isk faucet versus inflation. I don't think there is inflation, but uh, Brisk, this was something you were kind I, I of talking I about. Don't, I don't think there is either. January and I were talking with some folks last night, and you know, while if you look at the numbers, the money supply uh, in, is, in Isk has never been higher. We broke a record this year, uh, this month. We're over thirteen hundred trillion uh, Isk in, in money supply. Yet at the same time, if you look at the CPI and the other indexes that, that you would look at to try to measure inflation in the economy, it's just not there. So, I mean, that, that makes me think that there are a lot of people sitting on a lot of is that they're not doing a lot with. Uh, and that's kind of surprising. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's also pretty clear that the amount of, of money entering the economy um, from ratting bounties in particular, uh, it, it's just it's not sustainable. And, and that's something that's going to need to be looked at. Uh, I'm looking at the top eight sinks and faucets over time uh, graph, and if you if you pull that up, um, you'll see we, we had a, a basically a record-breaking month uh, in December for for ratting bounties, and that's even after CCP nerfed the anomaly uh, cycle time on certain anomalies in in NullSec, uh, the ones that were being most harvested by super carriers, the, the, the rock havens and things along those lines. So even with that minor change, which frankly has been noticeable, but not noticeable in terms of, of it slowing down the ISK velocity. So that kind of surprised me. I thought that would be a little bit more pronounced than it was. Uh, but I do think that it's, it's, it's getting to the point where we really need to look at, you know, how much ISK is being entered into the economy, where it's going and, and uh, what the potentials are for that uh, in the event that all that money starts getting spent. So I, I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. I think on the uh, meta show just the other day on Imperium News, uh, to which they had uh, Arathon, and uh, although I haven't seen it, I can imagine what was said, and it was probably celebrating the uh, juggernaut of an economy that goons have built inside of Delve region and surrounding areas, Aquarius period basis. Um, anybody watch that knows like what was talked about there? Or not. Didn't mean to embarrass ourselves. 
Um, no, I haven't had a chance to see it, unfortunately. Yeah, a lot of us will have to check it out. Um, but yeah, so is there anything telling about that, or is that more of the same old news that uh, games are doing a lot of mining? I think that's probably the same news. I mean, that's that's kind of the thing. Uh, I think the the problem. One of the other problems I will say is if you look at all the all the graphs in terms of, of how high the production value is in Delve compared to the rest of the game, what worries me and what I'm very concerned about is I don't think it's a good idea for CCP to be balancing the game based on what the biggest group does. Because anything that they do that's designed to specifically nerf the goons or specifically nerf the Imperium and their ability to, to, to mine Delve and, and those types of things, is going to have a huge, a much bigger impact on every other group in the game than it will on them. So I think that whatever, whatever they, whatever anybody's starting to look at or, or trying to come up with ideas to try to f to fix whatever they think may be wrong going on in Delvin, that's that's arguable from from uh, your perspective. Uh, I think it's a very dangerous thing if we start looking at uh, you know one area of space or one group and saying we need to nerf these guys because they're doing more than everybody else combined. I think that's a bad thing. So. It's, it's not an easy line to walk. Yeah. Uh, and the thing about the MER that we know it is true, uh, when it first uh, came out, I don't know if it was first came out or was rebooted because it had come out before. I think it might have been when it first came out. There was some talk that a, CS, a certain CSM member, we know it was Aerith, said that looks like a lot of intel um, that you're giving out for free, like how the economy is going and who to attack and, and that sort of thing. And <clears throat> it was it was important because a lot of people said, hey, this is the CSM influencing CCP to hide the uh, Goon Swarm and the Imperium as they grow. And that kind of power is like not, it's not fair for CSM members to wield that kind of power over um, the uh, the game. And it turns out that they went ahead and released those numbers anyway. Uh, and, <laughs> and I remember Aerith playing it the other way, saying, yeah, we actually wanted that information to go out because it shows how much we're winning and so people will be drawn to us. Yeah, how much of that is spin, though? Cool. Sorry, what? How much of that is spin, though? Like, do you remember 2009 when they used to publish them as books that you could get at FanFest, the really thick quarterly economic reports? I actually never knew that. I didn't know that happened. Uh, yeah, Doctor Doctor Ao. Uh, Ao, I think that's that. It. Was the the economist I used to work at at CCP? He would compile those uh, stats and stuff. But I don't I think love, it was spin. I mean, I, I think um, I think when it comes to that type of information, goons will figure out a way to win no matter how it it is. It's either oh they're hiding how much we're growing and we can just make up numbers or. Oh, they're showing how much we're growing. Everyone, look, we're the best. Come join us. We're safe. We're the best. Woo, manifest destiny. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's spin. It's, it's, it, that's, that's, I love Aerith. That's what he does. He's, the, he's one of the best spin meisters in the game. And no matter what happens, he's going to say why this is good for guns. And that's what he does. Yeah, exactly. Uh, to, to the point that, that, you know, at least him advocating on behalf of that on the CSM was somehow, you know, too much power. I mean, the reality is, and, and it's, it's, it makes me laugh. CSM only have as, has as much power as CCP is willing to give us, and that means what our influence is, because we're not the ones making decisions. We're providing information, giving them I our ideas, whether they take those ideas like they did with Steve uh, and the and the Omni Search, or whether they ignore them, like they've done with a lot of other things we've brought up over the years. Uh, it, it's it's still up to them. So we can influence, but we can't force it or or decide or make them do anything. Uh, and I, I think in that regard, you know, when, when you see folks that are advocating for things that, that look or appear to be self-serving, I think that's also spin and can very easily be looked at from other perspectives. Um, yeah. It yeah, just but it happens some, a lot. There's some reality there because if you look at it, I remember noting when the MERs were coming out early on, Imperium was doing fine. As expected, they're mining the heck out of the area and building things and whatnot. But the thing that really jumped out at me was how high GOTG – uh, how high their ratting numbers were. In other words, they were making fortune out of uh, really harvesting their home in Decline. And sure enough, SIGs beelined it to GOTG and started assaulting the regions right below it. 
and that would be a uh, fade and pure blind. And that eventually uh, destabilized the area when Horde decided, you know, this place is too small and we're a meat shield for GOTG. That's not really our purpose. Let's move over here to Geminate where it's a little, uh, there's more room for us and it's, uh, you know, it'll be better for our growth potential. And that plus the assault of the SIGs turned into, you know, what became a, a huge, huge fight uh, between the South and the North there in 9 Tech 4 and, and beyond. We know what happened there over 2018. So I look back and I say, well, part of the reason that Imperium leadership would say, yeah, we'll fund these SIGs and yeah, you can use bigger and bigger doctrines is because they were wanting to wreck the potential for GOTG to actually make money uh, based on the MER reports. Although they would have spies and know there's a lot of activity, you wouldn't have it all collected and summarized like the MER provides without it. Well, at the same time, just look at the map. I mean, if you, you, you can tell where the most protected space is just by looking at the SOB maps. And in the areas that are difficult to get into and out of, like Delve, which is the reason why Delve in multiple eras of the game has been considered the fortress area. It was fortress when Bob was there. It's, it's, it's an area that, that frequently is, 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 is uh, uh, desired by the bigger groups because it's so easy to protect. You know, other areas are like that. I mean, the north, that whole area behind Declan, I mean, is, is almost impossible to get to unless you go through there. So a lot of these buffer systems uh, that the big guys pick up, those are those are where the fights are, but then behind it is all the 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 verdant pasture land of of ratting and mining, and that's where these guys go. And then, at least in terms of the north, in terms of the SIGs, it was easy to get to Declan from the south, and that's kind of I think really the reason why we ended up going up there uh, and moving there was because it was it was quick, and we we had a, a super highway to move our supers and 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 and, and uh, equipment up that way. Uh, it's much harder to get to the, to the eastern part of the map. We could, it's, it's very hard to get to Tenal. I mean, trying to get to PL, PL's farming territory, trying to get to those uh, NC Dots farming territory, you got to go through a lot more people to get there. So I think it made sense in that regard. Well, no doubt the sale of Fountain uh, to Initiative um, or the Imperium was a big, big deal that allowed that uh, the transit to become much easier. They could have made it anyway, but it just it became a lot easier because there was less risk of resistance or, um, or uh, I guess, uh, was it Black Legion? No, it was the culture. For, you know, Black Legion turned into the culture. Uh, culture kind of owned the area, pacified the Fountain Core group, that the, the natives basically, and kind of lived there, um, but didn't enjoy holding it. Um, but they were always a wild card because they could say, hey, let's set a trap for Goon Swarm if they try to go north. But once they said, you know what, we don't want to deal with this. We'll just sell it to the highest bidder. Um, it was a one bid thing, too. They really just approached Imperium. Imperium said, sure. Uh, and then that allowed them to take off and do what they wanted to do. But it, the unintended consequence or intended consequence was it's a path right up to pure blind and fade. <clears throat> so once those areas were assaulted and attacked and, you know, Fast forward a year, 2018 passes by, we realize that uh, Pure Blind and Fade now just are like, you know, devastated by war. Nobody can really occupy that space effectively. Fall, They completely fall off the monthly economic report. Like they're not even showing up on MER because they're not being a, they're not utilized by anyone. There's no ability to utilize them. Uh, so it's interesting what, you know, the difference a year makes and maybe possibly based off looking at MER strategically. Yeah, anything else jump out at you guys in there? I'm interested by the uh, the move out of Genesis. I, I have no idea what to attribute that to, but that's, that's pretty wild. I guess well, is, that it, is Perimeter and Genesis or in Lone Tra I can never remember where, where, where Perimeter is. But I would think that the that the test horde fighting, and and perimeter of the system the, is. You, I'm sorry to interrupt. You mean you don't know where perimeter of the system is? Which which region is it in? I can't. I never can remember off the top. Of oh, my head. it's a, it's in the forge right next to Jita. Oh, so, oh, yeah, it's in the forge. Yeah. Okay, so it wouldn't be perimeter. But I mean, the thing that I noticed, I've noticed outside of the MER that I think has been pretty cool is if you look at the war report between test and horde, uh, they've. 
had between them killed almost a trillion isk worth of material. That's huge. I think that's probably the biggest war, uh, actual war warp other than red versus blue that, that you've seen. Uh, and that's really only been going on for like the last five or six months. So that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, that, I, I think that, that might have an impact on a lot of the high sex stuff we've been seeing. Yeah, the the war is between Horde and Test. It's extending, of course, it's to to Horde's home ground, which is Geminate that they moved to, but it's also fought in High Sec in perimeter specifically, uh, but around all of Jita because of the offshoring money that you can make if you put down your own structure. We talked about that in the last show, but uh, if you listen to um, the midweek update, we had Sedio on from Pandemic Horde who explains uh, that war in, in its two fronts, basically. And there is a ton of money that is made there uh, in perimeter. And uh, Tess took it over from the people that Horde backed. Horde was making money, uh, protection money, uh, by protecting ICU or ICY, which is uh, I Choose You. But that went up and that was up, upended in, I guess, in October. And, uh, and so now it's been a few months of Tess making that money and Horde being the spoiler and trying to uh, uh, make them pay a price. And a lot of activities happen in that area. And it's actually a, a super convoluted little thing, too, because the I Choose You guys, they just, they'll throw up temporary uh, little citadels and throw all of their freaking uh, plexes in there and just slightly undercut tests when they're not paying attention. So for like two or three days, or not even, for a day or two, uh, a lot of that money will get siphoned off, and they they just go sit and they and they laugh and pat themselves on the back, and, and you know that's that's classic Eve, right? Everyone wants to to be the one playing the spoiler, but it's <laughs> yeah, funny yeah. to see to see that that's their like guerrilla warfare tactic is to throw their police is absolutely right. It, it, it's hilarious, and, and it's funny because I always said to myself, all right, why Horde has control or at least had control over perimeter, which was other than Jita, like the big the big tax free offshore haven. You know, and it, it's kind of like the Bahamas of, of Eve. And I always laugh because I'm like, why doesn't one of these other bigger groups go in there and take it? Why isn't Goons taking it over? They don't need to. They have their own in 1DQ. But it's why are some of these other groups taking it? It seems like there's a lot of money. Why aren't they taking it over? And now that I look and I listen to Pro God complain about all the stuff that they have to do, it's a real headache. I mean, it is just a 24-hour a day, seven days a week thing that they have to deal with uh, to try to, to maintain, you know, a monopoly over those markets and it's not easy so i give them credit for it they're, they're doing their best uh but i don't know if anybody else other than tester maybe horde or one of these big groups could could pull it off uh, effectively yeah it's not as passive of, a, of a, an income stream as you wouldn't otherwise think or yeah well and, and it's and it's built it could maybe only happen in the jita area because if you put down a structure you get essentially 48 hours of money making potential before uh, it gets destroyed. And so, you know, I think the setting the tax rate at zero, you're not really making that money back. But if you have deep pockets and you just want to play the spoiler, you can just put up structure after structure after structure and lose the money. Uh, but at the same time, you're undercutting the 0.3% the test is charging in order to, for them to make money in the area. Um, but even if you were to put a 0.2 or a 0.1, uh, and people were to use it, there's uh, there's a lot of money you can siphon away from Test. So Test is making less money and doing more work trying to hammer down all these upstarts that are happening around the Jita area. But again, I think that's specific to Jita because of the amount of money. And in 48 hours, at a 0.2% or a 0.1%, which may not be attractive enough to bother with you know a station that's temporary, but it may. And if it does, uh, you can probably make as much money as the structure is worth and so it creates an infinite cycle of ability to um, propagate these things around tests. So it's it's a, a huge game of whack-a-mole, right? Not that I've ever played that. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what it is. You never played whack-a-mole, Matterall? I actually never played whack-a-mole. It's too violent for you, I guess. I felt, felt bad for the Gophers or whatever they are. The, it's like the, the top five Chuck E. Cheese game of all time. <laughs> yeah, exactly, man. That's, that's skee-ball and whack-a-mole. That's what you got to do. Chuck E. Cheese, what the privileged kids did. Uh, I had to play with sticks and dirt clods um, back in my day. Well, all right. So um, thanks very much, Jurius, for reporting on uh, MER. Uh, 
you burned through that so fast. I'm going to have to go back and listen to this show and see what you said. <laughs> but happy to. I, I can go slower next time if you want. No, no, it's good. Um, I'm glad you looked at it with an analysis that wasn't just goons are winning this game. It's uh, it's neat to see all the stuff that's going on. That's one thing I, I don't think we've talked enough about. It's just all the other things that are going on in Eve Online besides the the general arcs and the you know the big groups. Uh, I think the most interesting stuff is just not what we tend to hear about in most mediums. So again, we're gonna this year, 2019, we're really gonna try to get the smaller stories that are that are interesting. All right. Um, you guys got anything else? If not, let's just wrap up the show and wait for the next midweek report. If, By the way, audience, if you're not uh, catching those, you should. They are released in podcast form as well. Um, we are all caught up now with January's uh, shows all put online. You can see them all on talkinginstations.com. But uh, it's, a, it's a great, uh, Artemis is doing a great job uh, flushing out some topics that, that we can't get to. I guess there's just one more thing I wanted to know. And Brisk, I'm going to embarrass you because we all know you work in Washington, D.C. And you're, um, uh, is lobbyist uh, still a bad word? Because, it, it, you know. Uh, yeah, it is. And, and when I say I'm a politician and a lobbyist and a lawyer, it's like hitting the trifecta of things everybody hates. So there you go. <laughs> well, I don't hate politicians. I like them. I think it's super interesting work. I always thought that if... Um, Dreams of uh, of kids are to be some kind of uh, government official or to work in the movie business. So if you can't do one, you do the other, uh, at least in California. Well, as, as we say in Washington, uh, uh, politics is Hollywood for ugly people. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of cross-pollination in big dreams. <clears throat> but uh, tell us about your story recently. Like what's going on in Washington? This is a little bit of real life, everyone. It's fine. Uh, it's, you it's, had a funny situation with uh, Nancy Pelosi, right? Well, I, I, there's a lot of stuff been going on lately. And I, I've been running into the speaker quite a bit. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's been very interesting, uh, all of the conversations. But my, my phone happened to be buzzing uh, because somebody was ch chatting in the uh, ping channels. Uh, and she noticed it, and and I had a little little conversation with her about that. It was kind of funny. Uh, it, it happens all the time. Uh, but one of the things, at least in Washington lately, has just been uh, the shutdown and all this other type of stuff. There's a lot of uncertainty, uh, and a lot a lot of people are are concerned about it. And and that has made that has cut into my eve time. Uh, I've missed a, a couple of CSM meetings because there's just been too much work going on for those of us who are still working, uh, and that's made it tough. But it, it, it's been kind of funny. I think it's super interesting. Uh, and, and a guy like you that's interested in working in, in I don't know, public policy, like uh, EVE Online must be the perfect game. Uh, it is. And it's funny because, you know, when I, the, the two games that I think I probably spent the more, more time playing than any other, other have been Star Wars Galaxies and EVE Online. And the reason why is in both of these situations, they were sandbox games with user generated content and politics. And that always and it drew me to that. And I think one of the things you find in Eve is quite often what you do in real life ends up being what you do in the game. Uh, you know, I'm a politician. I'm a, I'm a Eve space lawyer. I'm a space lawyer. And now I'm a, a, a lawyer in real life. Now I'm a space lawyer and, and an Eve politician, which I never expected uh, to be. Uh, but those are the types of things that you get drawn towards. Uh, a lot of folks that are computer programmers and and, and big software guys end up running all of our, our uh, um our offline services and things like that. So it yeah. just, it, it turns into, it turns into what you do. Yeah. So I, I think it's funny. And frankly, you know, CSM is literally my day job. I, I basically, I, what I would say to folks who don't know what the CSM is, it's not a legislature. It's not like being a politician. It's like being a lobbyist. You're basically going in and, and talking to these guys and providing your perspective from your, your players, your constituents, uh, and trying to convince these guys to do something, but they're the ones who make the decision and actually do the work. So a lot of the soft skills that I have uh, in my day job, they translate pretty well to CSM, which is, I think, a good thing, at least for me. Yeah, well, perfectly suited. Um, <clears throat> keep working on that wormhole vote, though. <laughs> it's a, it's well, a, they're mad at me. so It'll okay. bite you. 
Well, you know, hey, what I, what I laugh about is no matter how much those guys get angry uh, and they want to chase me around and call me names and everything like that, it's fine. I still represent them. You know, mm-hmm. uh, they don't have to like me for me to represent them. And I, I'm not going to be mean all to them, them just because they don't like me. So, <laughs> Well, anyway, good luck with all that. And it's very interesting. I love to see the, uh, you know, I'm watching, I'm reading national headlines or international headlines. And then you see that it's, there's implications inside of EVE Online because a lot of EVE Online people are connected to um, stuff that happens in the real world. And the biggest one that we remember is uh, when Vile Rat passed away. Unfortunately, that was all happening real time in in the game because I think Matani came out on Twitter and said like, my fr- my one of my one of my leaders or CEOs basically said, uh, shots fired because he's in Benghazi and he wrote that on Twitter before anybody knew anything. And I was like, whoa! I, I think I was the, one of the first people to write him back saying like, you know, I hope he's safe or something. And it was like, I never wrote with Matani, didn't know Matani. Uh, I was uh, not, you know, but it just, it struck me that something in real life was entering into the game and to send condolences. Uh, and then obviously that turned out to be tragic and horrible. Um, but it, it, it was just such an interesting thing to watch in, in both universes. And, and the you, uh, it's real life. Yeah. And you brisk are also in the position to, uh, to do the same thing because uh, when I'm watching headlines about the U.S. government and especially now when it's dramatic and shut down that, uh, that you know, your phone's ringing off the hook because you guys are pinging you to get into a fleet or something. It's, it's, it's funny how that is. I mean, it was funny when we did the announcement um, uh, of, of who won. I was sitting at a fundraiser uh, with a congressman from New York and, and he's like videotaping me, giving my like congratulatory thing. It was, it was just the, 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 Connections of real life and the game are, are pretty common, and uh, it's interesting to see how you know the, the diverse backgrounds of people that play Eve. You got folks that do what I do, and folks that do a ton of other things, and we're all playing together uh, and hanging out at the same place. It's kind of cool. A great leveler, I guess. Yeah. All right, guys. This is uh, let's wrap up this show. Uh, I want to say thank you to uh, everybody that showed up today. Um, I was very surprised, very pleased. I just want to make a quick note that we are getting such good numbers live. I uh, expected those numbers to go way down because we're not able to really tell, uh, it wouldn't be fair to tell the Imperium when we're on and stuff. So this is all talking in stations numbers. I'm really happy to see that we really haven't taken a hit as far as viewerships on the live section. Uh, so thank you guys for tuning in and, and following talking to stations uh, as we move to a new channel. And I also want to thank all the subscribers today. Uh, it's great to see that and uh, the people who gave bits. And um, we didn't intend to take advantage of the channel's uh, fundraising mechanisms, but we are doing that. And uh, we're very happy to see that you guys appreciate the show uh, on the live version. For the podcast version, for people who don't get to see this live or watch the video afterwards, we have the podcast version of the show, which is usually cleaned up and edited and takes a few hours to do that every time. Uh, that is uh, serviced by Patreon, so uh, you can help us con- with contributions there. And all that, all that can be found uh, at talkinginstations.com. And we're going to be bringing some new things to the website, and we'll talk about those a little later on when we get them going. I did say there was going to be a newsletter that is going to go out. I wanted it to start in January. Uh, but we're trying to stabilize the two shows uh, during the week to make sure they have good content and uh, good technical uh, execution. And we're having some trouble on the technical part on uh, midweek show. And, and sometimes uh, the content uh, takes a lot more work on the Sunday show. So once we get those running and smooth, we'll, I'll turn to writing and we'll start putting out some kind of a newsletter in-game and uh, also uh, in your email box if you want it. All right. Thanks again for the uh, subs. Really appreciate it. Uh, I want to say thank you to uh, Jurius Doctor, Elise Randolph, Carneros, and Brisk Rubal. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Matterall. Yeah, and soon we'll have a, a Matterall emote for all those people that sub too. Yeah. Yeah, we need to we need to have some TIS emotes. That'll be great. We're we're working on art with uh, Corin Ma, who's uh, helping us out, and uh, he and I are talking. He was a little busy over the holidays, but uh, we're going to come out with some new graphics and some some new fun stuff uh, for you guys. So look forward to that. 
Um, well, that wraps it up for us. That is all we have time for this week. We'll see you next week on Talking in Stations. <laughs>